Welcome back to Charlotte, Fry Gillier. Thank you, Cy. It's really good to be back and see so many old friends here and to uh, have my friend Annie Deschant uh, with us, too. Annie is a songwriter from Nashville. She and I have been going around for the last couple of years and doing programs, uh, kind of looking at music through the lens of literature, looking at its ability to touch the human heart and uh, uh, speak to things that people care about, including uh, the theme of justice. Um, perhaps as effectively as great novels or other forms of writing. And so tonight we're going to blend a little bit of reading, a little bit of storytelling with, uh, with some really great uh, music. So I'm going to read a little snippet that will help uh, set the stage for the evening, I think. And it's so cool I can actually see. This is great. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Some people say it has its roots in the mountains. This music he has made for 25 years. Cy Khan will tell you there's some truth to that. Long before his work as an organizer brought him to Charlotte, North Carolina, the base for his assault on social injustice, he had a little cabin in the North Georgia hills. It was a sawmill shack with a ramshackle porch where his neighbors would come, it seemed like every day to play their banjos, dulcimers, and fiddles, maybe an auto harp or a guitar. Nobody knew, of course, that he would go on from there to become one of the important folk singers of his, of his time, or that he would use his gift of poetry and music in his work as an organizer in the South. He had never even been to that part of the country until the summer before his senior year in college. It was 1965, a time of trouble in the deltas of Arkansas and Mississippi. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, was working on the task of voter registration, which had proven at times to be a fatal undertaking. Three civil white rights workers had been murdered the previous summer in Mississippi, their youthful bodies buried in, buried in a dam. And for Khan and others who chose to return, there was a fear that never seemed to go away. It was with us every minute, he said. And for a while, the symbolism of it was macabre because when he arrived in the town of Forest City, Arkansas in the Delta country just west of Memphis, the only place to stay was a funeral home, bedding down in a room next door to the corpses. The days were spent in, in a physical labor, building a community center where the organizers could hold mass meetings and in furtive trips to the scattered farmhouses where a handful of black people, old and young, decided to join the crusade for civil rights. Khan remembered one old woman well past 100 who was born a slave and had never even tried to vote in her life. Too dangerous, she said. White people didn't like it. But it was something she had wanted to do before she died. The only problem was she would have had to get up from her rocking chair, the most comfortable place in her small wooden cabin, and she didn't want to do it. But Khan and the others said, no problem. They picked up her chair and carried the old woman to the back of a pickup truck and then to the register, registrar's office in town. There were moments like that that made it worthwhile, but the fear settled in again every night, and the only thing that drove it away was the music. All through the summer, the civil rights people would gather for meetings in the chapel up the road, and one of those evenings, the freedom singers came they were a group from SNCC who sang all the standards. We shall not be moved. Ain't nobody going to turn us around. And then finally, at the end of the night, as the people spilled out of the pews and joined hands, they sang the most powerful anthem of the times, We Shall Overcome. Sai was astounded at the emotion of the moment. The fear motivated the singing, he said, and gave it wings. Took one small step and proved everybody wrong. fire they ain't afraid to fall they live to risk it all if you're gonna do a lot then you gotta be a little out there a seamstress from montgomery alabama stay seated on a bus and took a stand that brazen little move caused a revolution she broke every boundary when she wouldn't budge an inch 
So if you think that you won't make a difference That what you're trying to prove is too bizarre Remember it's the dreamers The do or die believers That march right into history Just being who they are Out there Dancing on a wire Out there Running through the fire They ain't afraid to fall They live to risk it all If you're gonna do a lot Then you gotta be a little I had recently been to Birmingham and interviewed the Reverend John Cross, minister of the 16th Street Baptist Church, the target of a Sunday morning bomb. It was a day, Cross said, that began with such promise. September 15th, 1963, full of bright sunshine and the singing of hymns, a morning when the older children in the church would serve as ushers and sing in the choir at the main Sunday service. But at 1029, the bomb exploded. When Cross first felt the building shake, he thought momentarily of the hot water heater. They had been having trouble with it, and he wondered if the pipes had finally blown. But then he heard people screaming, and he rushed outside and saw a gaping hole in the wall. He quickly joined those digging through the rubble and uncovered a patent leather shoe. That's Denise's shoe, said M.W. Pippin, a church layman who was frantically digging beside him. Pippin knew his granddaughter, Denise McNair, often wore the same kind of shoe, and almost as soon as he had spoken the words, he and Cross came upon the bodies. First Denise, and then her friends, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Addie Mae Collins. As the tears of rage streamed down Pippin's face, he screamed aloud what many people felt, I'd like to blow the whole town up. Then came the most astounding, astounding part. Three days later, Martin Luther King Jr. preached the eulogy for the children, and this is what he said. History has proven over and over again that unmerited suffering is redemptive. So in spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not despair. We must not become bitter, nor must we harbor the desire to retaliate with violence. We must not lose faith in our white brothers. Somehow we must believe that even the most misguided among them can learn to respect the dignity and worth of all human personalities. I had always wondered how the sermon was received. How could people in the church that day, including the shattered families of the children, possibly have listened to such noble words? On a magazine assignment a few years later, I came to Birmingham to interview Claude Wesley, father of Cynthia. Mr. Wesley was a principal in the Birmingham schools a thin and wispy gray-haired man who wanted his students to understand black history, the taproots of freedom going back a hundred years. We took our seats in his living room and he, and he explained that he saw the bombing that way as a terrible, heartbreaking personal loss that was nevertheless tied to a much bigger story. As he talked, he glanced at a portrait on the wall, a radiant smile on the round, pretty face. Such a beautiful girl, I said. Yes, he replied, she was a very happy child. She always liked to be in the forefront. Her teachers used to say if they could get Cynthia on their side, they could get the whole class. We talked for a while about the Birmingham movement and the changes he had seen in the city. Birmingham is now a good town, he said. It wanted to be a good town then, but there were some forces standing in the way. Finally, I came to the question I had driven all the way to Birmingham to ask. What about the eulogy? How did it feel to be called to forgiveness when bitterness and rage were more natural inclinations? Shine, Lord, oh, shine, Lord, in light the weary Show us your kindness, peace, and love unfurled with arms open wide. You will teach us to abide. 
send us our Savior to sing us a new song. They are arms on the ground. Let the joyful trumpet sound. Shine, Lord, oh shine. Brother, sister.